In case you don't know, I'm a rookie cop in a small rural Pennsylvania town currently stuck working the night shift. I work your normal patrol shift, driving around pulling traffic, responding to your usual domestic disputes and whatever other wonderful calls dispatch sends my way. Last week was crazy at work for me. You can read about that in my other post. And right as I thought life was returning to normal, I now find myself in the eye of yet another unsettling investigation. I woke up early afternoon to a purring on my chest. Haley, this cat has become the love of my life since we found each other about a week ago. However, I could do without my new vibrating alarm clock. I gave her a few scratches before guiding her off my chest. I glanced at the clock and saw it was already 1300 hours. I got out of bed, showered, and slowly began preparing to go in for work that night. I put on my uniform, geared up, and headed out the door. Roll call was pretty short and sweet since we were getting busy and Sergeant Oakley wanted bodies on the road as soon as possible. Right before breaking, Sergeant Oakley made sure to add, And Barkley, try not to have another shitstorm follow you. Yeah? I was in the middle of a conversation when dispatch interrupted me. Dispatch to 1034. 1034, go ahead. Are you able to respond to a 911 hangup? Affirmative. What's the address? Old Schoolhouse Road. Show me en route. I racked up my cruiser and headed towards the house. Every time someone calls 911 and hangs up, we are obligated to respond if dispatch is unable to call back and speak with someone. As the rookie, I am quite familiar with responding to these hangups. A little too familiar. I turned down the gravel road, kicking up dust in my tourist's path. I stopped a few yards away from the old log cabin and approached quietly. To my surprise, there was an elderly woman sitting in her floral chair watching television. I didn't see anyone else in the house, so I approached and knocked. Officer Barclay with the police department, please come to the front door. The woman slowly raised herself from her chair and held onto her walker. She came to the front door and greeted me. Hello there, officer. Is there something wrong? Ma'am, is everything all right? We received a 911 hang-up from this residence. She responded. Oh, yes. Everything is just fine here, officer. It was probably just my husband. I became more alert and instantly asked, Where is your husband? I need to go check to make sure he's alright then. She shrugged her shoulders and pointed towards the fireplace. He's right there, officer. I looked to where she was pointing, but nobody was there. I became concerned. Ma'am, I don't see your husband. Can you please tell me what room he is in? She slowly walked over to the mantle and pointed to the center. He's here, officer. She pointed to an urn. Oh, I see him now. I am so sorry for your loss. I wasn't sure what the response to that was going to be, but I knew it was important to not mislead her and pretend that he was still alive. Yes, why thank you. Saying sorry is such an odd tradition, don't you think? I mean, I know you aren't the reason he died. Anywho, I'm sorry that you came out for that. Ever since Samuel passed a few months ago, he's been messing with the wires. He turns the lights on and off and I keep getting phone calls saying they are returning my call. But I never called them. I guess it's his way of letting me know he's still here with me. I don't really believe in paranormal, but that doesn't mean it doesn't freak me out. I gave the woman a heartfelt smile and reached out my hand. I'm sorry, I didn't get to formally introduce myself. I'm Sarah Barkley. Please, feel free to call me Sarah. 
Oh, hi, Sarah. I'm Rose. It's very nice to meet you. Again, I'm sorry you got called out here for nothing. I'm sure you have much more important places to be. No, it, it's, it's quite all right. This is an important call to me. However, per my department's protocol, I need to check your home to make sure that there isn't anyone else in here who could have made the call. Is that all right? Yes, of course. I understand. I'll just sit out here. I've been home all day, though. There certainly isn't anyone here but me. She settled back into her chair and continued watching her television as if I wasn't even there. I started to check the first floor of the cabin. I cleared the kitchen, then the family room, and made my way to the master bedroom. I made sure to check every closet and everywhere that a person could physically fit to hide. First floor was clear, so I headed to the basement. I saw an old workbench covered in different machines and tools used for loading ammunition. I know these items quite well, since it's a hobby my dad has had for years. Everything was covered in dust and looked as though loading ammunition was an old hobby of Samuel's. I could see he had an assortment of empty clean shells lined up on a tray as if he was preparing to load them. He had a very fine antique loading press that I know would make my dad jealous. I wondered if Rose knew the value of these antiques. As I made my way down his workbench, I was impressed with his organization and tidiness. It was all set up, ready for him to return to work at any moment. I glanced towards the corner of the cellar door, where I saw his jacket hanging on a single hook. I began to wonder if Rose had been waiting for him to come home after all these months. I made my way around to the laundry room and finally headed back upstairs after clearing the basement, wedging my dusty belt around between the stair railing and the chairlift that Rose had installed. I made my way upstairs and walked through the family room to another set of stairs leading to the second floor loft. I slowly walked up the stairs and opened the door to the loft bedroom. I could smell the stale air from the room that clearly has not been used in years. I checked the closet and under the bed, nothing. Right as I went to leave, I noticed a small cubby door in the corner behind the door. Again, I had to check anywhere that a person could possibly hide, so I opened the cubby door with my left hand, holding my gun in my right hand. The storage space was pitch black. I grabbed my flashlight and shined it. The cubby space was nearly empty except for an old lamp, a wooden sled, and an old trunk with brass locks. When I looked at the old trunk, every hair on the back of my neck stood up and goosebumps covered my arms. My intuition has saved my life many times, so I have learned to follow it. I slowly crawled through the cubby, making my way towards the trunk. I opened the lid and found a trunk full of various items. No person hiding in here. I released an audible sigh of relief. I decided to drag this trunk out of the cubby, especially since I knew Rose was unable to walk up those stairs, and I thought maybe this would be something she would like to know about. I hollered over the railing. Rose, there's an old trunk in this cubby hole. Did you know that was up here? Rose replied. What? What trunk? I decided to carry it down to her to let her look through it. I set it down at her feet and opened it. I could see it much clearer now that we were in the light. There were old newspaper clippings, photographs, and an old clothing. One photograph in particular caught Rose's eye. She leaned over and picked up the photograph, caressing the edges. She began to cry, and my immediate response was to comfort her. Rose, I'm so sorry. What's wrong? She sat and cried for a few moments. When she was able to answer, she said, It's, it's a photograph of my granddaughter. I not only lost her once, I lost her twice. Sometimes the pain is just too much to bear. I asked, What do you mean you lost her twice? Rose responded, Don't you know, honey? My granddaughter was Michelle Klein. A woman the police found in the Patch Lane house. <laughs>